they'll get you signed up. Okay, out on the patio. All right. So here at Calvary Chapel, it's through the Bible on Sunday. So if you join me in 2 Kings chapter 17, that's where we left off. There's ushers walking around with uh, analog Bibles if you need one. <laughs> you just get their attention and borrow one, keep it. They want to make sure you can follow along. We cover the whole chapter today, 2 Kings 17. And uh, the title is Walking in the Fear of the Lord. Walking in the Fear of the Lord. Lots of people think that the fear of the Lord is only an Old Testament expression when God was mean. Then after Jesus came, who's nice, then the believers don't need to fear the Lord anymore, right? That's Old Testament. Well, that's not true. <laughs> First of all, God is the same always, right? He never changes. So it's God's idea. He so loved the world that he sent his son. And so uh, the things about God, his attributes, they, they're, they're for all time. <laughs> not, there's not like this split at the Old and New Testament gods, right? So uh, there's that. And then the expression, the fear uh, of the Lord and the fear of God is used several times in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 9, I think it's verse 31, it says that the early church walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, one of the difficulties is I don't think that that expression, uh, the, the meaning of it is really conveyed in our English language because we think fear of the Lord is being afraid of something, right? And, you know, there, there is some to that because if I were to reject God's grace my whole life and stand before him, I should be afraid because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So th that needs to be, to be set. However, when, we, when it comes to particularly the believers and those who are God is drawing by his grace to himself, the fear of the Lord is better said like honor him, to reverence him, to to be in awe of him and aware of his presence and respect and do what he says. Those uh, kinds of things. But here in 2 Kings, Israel is not doing any of those things. And so really this chapter focuses on what happens when you don't walk in the fear of uh, of God. There's two parts that I'm going to cover here today. Part one looks at all the causes. Like what are the causes of not walking in the fear of God? And then part two we look at here today is the consequences of it. And, the, and it's split in half uh, in this chapter. And then at the end what I'm going to do is just take a moment to uh, finish up with how to walk in the fear of the Lord. Now some of that will be kind of sprinkled throughout but I'm going to emphasize it at the end so we walk out of here uh, with understanding uh, what that really means for us, for the church particularly uh, today. So part one, we're going to look at causes here. And um, that is what leads uh, to the Jews back then not walking with God. Okay, so let's start here in verse one of chapter 17 of 2 Kings. And here's what. It says, in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, the son of Elah, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he reigned nine years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. All right, so Samaria is basically the headquarters, HQ, of the northern tribes of Israel. You, you understand that there's, there, it's split into two. After David and Solomon, it divided into two. Right, the northern tribes, there's ten of them, and then the southern tribes of Judah are two, Judah and uh, Samaria. All the other rest are in 
in the north. Hosea is the last king of the northern tribes. And he did evil. They All those kings of the north did evil. Some of the southern kings are good. We're going to get to uh, Hezekiah next in 2 Kings. I think he's next. And he's a good king. And there's some. But all of the northern uh, Israel kings are evil uh, guys. And so they are the first ones to be conquered. And they're going to be run out of their homeland. Because Assyria is now the powerhouse of the world at this particular time in history. And Israel has been paying them money. Right? It's, it's sort of like if, you know, if you lived in the era of, era of the mafia. Uh, I don't know if that, how much of that is still active today. But, you know, you picture a, a small business owner in Brooklyn or something. And they have to pay the mafia so that they don't burn down their store. Right? So it's kind of like that, right? They're, they're paying them off. And, but there's this new king in Assyria. And so Hosea thinks it's a good time to withhold payment uh, to him. And so at the same time, he makes friends with this king uh, of Egypt as sort of an ally and strengthen him up uh, and strengthen their position. But the king of Assyria found out about that and it says there that he locks him up, right? We read that together. You see what's happening is Hosea is like all the other kings of Israel. He doesn't look to God for help. And it's a big mistake when you're not looking to God for help. And, and in this case, it costs him dearly, right? So that's the introduction to what's going on here. So let's continue. I'm going to read kind of a bigger section, verses 5 through 12. It says, now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried away, carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods. And they had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, which they had made. Also, the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. And they built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city, they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. And they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. Okay, so basically what's happened is instead of fearing God, they've feared other gods, right? That's why we end up like this, or like someone ends up like this. Um, again, going back to what the definition of fearing is, they've honored, so to speak, these other gods, committed themselves uh, to them. And of course, that's a big problem, isn't it? You see, you guys... Satan wants to destroy people. But he can't just walk up to someone and say, I'm going to destroy you. <laughs> because if he did, nobody would go for it. <laughs> I don't want to be destroyed, you know. I don't want my life ruined. So what he does is very crafty. He tempts people with things that seem good, but lead them astray. And I was thinking as uh, worshiping uh, earlier with you guys that this chapter is sort of like uh, in, in, in some places, they don't have much around our town, but if you go out on roads, out on the, the interstate and, and beyond, usually they have like rumble strips on, on the roads or those, 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 those buttons in the road that you run over and you know you run over the road because you start to drift over and then you come back in the center and this uh you know god does that with people he gives them those rumble strips so that we don't shipwreck our faith and ruin our life and those kind of things and 
And, uh, and so to me, that's, we, we see a lot of that here. And, but Because Satan is trying to rip people off. And he will do it through the way that people start to worship. Or who they listen to or what they believe. And, and he's very effective at those things. Because even though for those of us who are saved, we still have a sin nature. And people with a sin nature are drawn to darkness. So we have to be very wise about these things. But God, in his mercy and his grace, he wants to eliminate things from your life that are destructive. So th these, that's what these kind of chapters are here for, to remind us uh, of the destructive things and how to uh, avoid it. Uh, but it said there, did you go back, if you go back with me to verse 9, it said they secretly did things to provoke the Lord. Because that's where it starts, right? It's like in your heart and secretly, right? And then over time, it grows and it becomes more open and bold, which we see with these guys. And that's how what happens with the people uh, today. I was thinking about how in our culture, some, some sins that used to be done in secret are, are not now done in secret. And the first one that comes to my mind is homosexuality. You know, sort of that, that gay uh, lifestyle. It used to be, you know, when I was in my lifetime, it used to be a secret sin that people did. But now, it's openly out there, right? Like, it's even celebrated uh, a lot by people, uh, uh, promoted uh, as a, a good thing. Because people think, okay, well, now that it's open, and it's not secret, and, well, let's promote it as a good thing. And that's, our world is largely embracing uh, this. And, uh, but let me just tell you, plainly, that God is not on board with that. In the Bible teaches that he will hold accountable those who practice such things and those who promote them as good things because it's a sin. It's against the created order. And I think we all know that, but we've, we've, be, we've sort of deceive ourselves into thinking that it's a good thing because we know somebody who's involved in that and we love them, right? And so you don't want to sound like a bigot and those kind of things. But the fact of the matter is, it's a sin against God, and it used to be secret, and now it's open. And there's a lot of things like that, but that's the one major one um, that, that jumps out. And so uh, the, the, those who practice such things need to be warned. Because just like Samaria there in verse 12, they are provoking the Lord to anger. This is a serious matter. And I would, I would be wrong if I didn't warn the people who come to our church about these things. Now listen, I am not condemning anybody. As a young man, I was far from God. I did all kinds of things to provoke him. I was in big trouble. The biggest trouble you can have. And that's to be under the, the, the potential judgment of the creator God. I was in huge trouble and headed for the cliff. But the moment I put my trust in Jesus Christ, he forgave me for everything that I had offended against him, and I immediately had peace with God. <laughs> and, and whatever you might be involved with, that thing we just talked about or something else, there is a place for grace for you too. Just like there is for me and for anybody else. I mean, that's why God sent his son for us sinners. <laughs> and whatever we've fallen into, whether we're just, com we're just lying all the time or stealing or, or whatever the thing is, dishonoring our parents. I mean, the sins go on and on. It doesn't have to be a sexual sin. And one last thing about that. You know, um, sometimes because... Christians were so badly wanting to lead people to the Lord <laughs> that we, we downplay how important repentance is. It's not that, that someone would say, well, God loves you, just stay the way that you are. 
Yeah, he will, you can come as you are, but we're not supposed to continue in our sin. That's what repentance is. I'm supposed to turn towards Jesus away from who I was. It wouldn't have been right if I kept going the way I was going as an alcoholic and, and, and just a, a liar and a blasphemer and just say, well, God loves me anyway. <laughs> That's not right. I turn from my sins and put my trust in Jesus Christ. Not that you're perfect, not that I'm perfect, but that's who I am now. I don't practice such things uh, anymore. And when you do that, you receive forgiveness for everything we've ever done. And so uh, if that's you, I pray that before you leave here today that you put your trust in Christ and he wants to forgive you. Don't leave here without that happening in your life. There's one more thing here before we go on uh, in verse 12. Did you see it said that they served idols? Served idols. So what's the big deal about that? Why does that come up so much in the Bible? Well, God knows that if we worship, that's another way of saying serve is to worship. You know, when you guys go serve in kids ministry or in hospitality or, or you give or you play, you know, lead us up here. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of worship, right? And so, so to serve uh, uh, something else is to worship it and, and God knows that that devalues human life. And people will lose a sense of why we were created. And we will begin to see ourselves as, as animals and, and start to act like wild animals. We see that in our culture all the time. Somebody said, and I can't remember who it was, he said, uh, we resemble the objects we adore. And we sure do. Uh, the, the Psalms teach that. I wanted to show you one of the Psalms. Psalm 115, verse 8. Look what it says. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Uh, the psalmist here is talking about false idols, false gods. You know, to beware of honoring those. Giving reverence to, to false things. That is to, to put things in your life, friend, above God. Don't do that. <laughs> it, 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 it leads to a bad place. And you weren't made. You are made in the image of God. And made to worship him. So we want to keep him first. Well, I'm going to continue now in verse 13 and 14. It says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. So they stiffen their necks. That's a really good way to put it, isn't it? The Bible is just, uh, just describes things so well. Stiffen their necks. When I read this, I was thinking about uh, our dog, Henry. Um, we used to have a, a he's, he's, he died uh, years ago, but uh, my wife and I had this, uh, our, our, our first child was a dog named Henry. <laughs> he was a big black lab, just great dog, a running partner, and, and uh, uh, he's just awesome. But he was very, very stubborn. <laughs> so stubborn that, you know, when he, he would just pull so hard on the leash. He would, he would like pull my wife almost down because he was just so strong and big. And so what we did is we got this little, this little inexpensive leash. I think it's called a halty or something. And it just goes around his, like his snout. And so then all you had to do to get him to change his direction was just give it a little tug, you know, and it would turn his head and then he would go that way. And it solved a lot of that problem uh, with us. But uh, Henry was also smart. <laughs> And he learned, like, I'd be out on a trail with him or something, and he began to learn which, where our patterns were and all that. And so he'd come to a fork in the trail or whatever, and he wanted to go right because there was like a pond over there or something. But I wanted to go left to go home. And so as we're approaching it, he would stiffen his neck, man. <laughs> you could see it, like physically he would stiffen it, you know. And so to try and keep that, you know, and I have to really tug on the halty. To, to get him to go because he was determined to go the way that he wanted to go. And that's exactly what Israel is doing then 
and unfortunately, what some of us are doing today. It would be like saying, I don't care what the Bible says, I am doing this. That's a stiff neck right there. And you may not even say it out loud. We may just think it. But that's what this is, right? And then, and then even worse, I think, is that we expect God to bless that. <laughs> Why isn't God blessing that? Well, because you're stiff-necked. <laughs> he didn't say go that way. So the, the, the lesson here <laughs> is don't be stiff-necked Henry, right? It's easy to just resist that. Do what God called you to. Because God, when he, he's so great. He's so merciful. He's so kind. He's, he's attempting to replace our sin with his goodness. He wants us to walk in the light. And, you know, that's how you walk in the fear of God. You walk in the light, right? And then you're in a good, good place. There is nothing to be concerned about when you're walking in the light. I've been reading this really good old book uh, with a friend uh, of mine. And it's called The Calvary Road uh, by Roy Hessian. And uh, there's this great quote in there. I wanted to read it to you. He said, it is utterly impossible for us to be walking in any degree of darkness and continue to have fellowship with God. It's really uh, quite interesting that he said that because he's, he's just summarizing what the Apostle John says in uh, 1 John. Because John said, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we are walking with God, we will walk in the light. It's as simple as that, right? And I think that's what this is all about here in verse 13, that we would reject the darkness and walk in the light of God only when that's presented uh, to us. Because if we do what they did, it really messes up our fellowship with God and each other. Have you ever noticed that when someone starts to, to drift away from God, they stop talking to other Christians too? You know, they, they say, I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to go to that Bible study anymore. You know, I don't, I don't return phone calls. And I, I mean, I've seen it again and again. And it's because our fellow, uh, problems with our fellowship with God affects our fellowship with other believers uh, too. So that's what we're seeing here. And that's what the warning is. <laughs> they won't hear. They stiffen their necks. Verse 14, 14 says they don't even believe now. Right? That's their basic sin. They're having faith problems. <laughs> and it, I think it all boils down to that. Well, it says in verse 15, it goes on, and um, they rejected God's statues and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he had testified against them. They followed idol idols. What else did they do? They... They became idolaters, and they went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves a molded image with two calves, made a wooden image, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served Baal, false gods. And they, and they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, child sacrifice. Practiced witchcraft and soothsaying and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Did you guys notice the progression here of how things are just getting worse and worse over time? At first, remember, they were, they were, just, they were just stubborn like my dog, right? Stiff-necked. Then it turned into unbelief. We read that before, right? And then now it says there in what we just read in those verses that they went after the nations. And then it says, then they left all of the things of God. And then in verse 17, the, 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 the worst of all, they just sold themselves to these evil things. Uh, you, you ever hear uh, the expression about a Christian, they're sold out for Christ, you know. Somebody who's on fire for the Lord, they're sold out for him. Well, they're sold out for evil now. And it didn't start that way, right? 
it's sort of like the slippery slope. And I think the slippery slope argument is overused <laughs> today. You know, everything's a slippery slope. But uh, here, it's real. <laughs> In spiritual, these things about God, there's something to be concerned about. Because he warns us that way. You know, going over the rumble strip. <laughs> and and I, I'm, I'm emphasizing this for a moment because I know people who have done this and it's heartbreaking and it leads to disaster and I don't know what God does with that but it's not good eventually they become hardened and they won't hear it anymore and it's dangerous uh, if, if you go back with me to verse 15 um, some versions I think the New American Standard and King James they say they followed vanity and that's a good way uh, to say this, you know, that it, that it means emptiness. So here they have <laughs> everything that God could give, and instead they're settling for emptiness. It, it, like uh, one of the examples it gives is uh, worshiping the host of heaven, right? So that would be like astrology and things like that. Or, you know, it got worse. We read it there together. The occult and child sacrifice and, and physically bowing down to wooden objects. I mean, the, uh, 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 someone made in the image of God is reduced to that. How, how tragic. And, and that's what happens when someone chooses to reject the saving grace of God. And so we're urged to not do that. That we would trust in him and walk with him. Well, what was the result of all that? Verse 18 says, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his side. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. Also, Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they made. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them from his sight. Well, this is where it ends up. God uh, uses the Assyrians now for the removal of Israel from their, their, their homeland. He, he casts them out, but he casts them out because of their conduct, right? That's the cause, right? We've been talking about these causes all through this section. And the cause of, of being cast out is they've rejected God. And so he gives them over to what they, what they wanted right? Which was evil. They behave like the other nations who he cast them out before when they inherited the promised land. And so now they're just following after because they don't believe, right? For he tore Israel, verse 21, from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nabat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. They were the first to go. I, I can't remember if I've already said that to you this, this morning. Um, because Jeroboam was the first king. So they started as a united kingdom, and then it split into two. The northern kingdom started with Jeroboam as the king, and then all the ones successive that followed him were, were evil. They did evil, every single one of them. So they are the first to go to, uh, out of their country and lose everything uh, to Assyria. And then Judah will follow uh, later, but right now we're focused on the northern tribes, these ten tribes. So they would be like, Dan and Manasseh and, and Reuben and, and so forth. Now some people call these the lost tribes of Israel. Have you ever heard that expression? The ten lost tribes uh, of Israel? Uh, but that's not a true statement because they're not lost. <laughs> they're just scattered. <laughs> right? Uh, um, some we know from Second Chronicles, that they actually returned with Judah after their captivity in Babylon, right? After their 70-year captivity, that some of these people returned to Israel uh, with them. There were others were, were scattered uh, around. It, what's interesting, I think how this got some 
momentum, this lost tribe stuff, is because early on in our country, in our nation, that Americans <laughs> wanted to put the United States in the Bible, to find it in the Bible someplace. And, and it's, you got to really read some things into it to find it, in my opinion. It's not there, really, the United States. Um, and so what they would do is this was a way, right, that, that well, the lost tribes are, you know, you know, it's talking about uh, the United States and so forth. And Joseph Smith, the Mormon, uh, really latched on to this. And he said the Native American Indians were descended from the lost tribes that came to the United States. And then the Mormons uh, come through them. But do you know that uh, DNA tests have proven that there's absolutely no connection between Native Americans and the Hebrews? So that's not true. So what is true? Well, James, in the New Testament, when he writes his letter, when he opens his letter, and you can go look at this on your own, he addressed it to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. <laughs> so that's 500 years after this. <laughs> so James writes a letter assuming that the tribe of Dan and the tribe of Asher and so forth all these are going to read... <laughs> His letter, they're going to get it, right? Because they're not lost, right? They're just scattered. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the, the people do come up, for example, Anna, who was around the temple when Jesus was born. Uh, she is from the tribe of Asher, and she is one of the, those ten uh, from the ten lost, lost tribes. Um, but the Hebrews are not lost. They're just scattered around the world. The Bible teaches that they're all in existence and they're going to regather in Israel in the last days. And when we go to Revelation next in about six weeks, uh, when we get to, I think, chapter 7 talks about that. And uh, uh, Israel is present in the last days and it is regathered there in, um, in Jerusalem. So it's very exciting. So God's not done with Israel yet and uh, those ten tribes. Well, those are the causes. We covered the causes during all that time. Now, the last part we're going to look at here today, or the second part, is the consequences, and this will go a little faster. And this is when you don't walk in the fear of the Lord. What are the consequences? So we've seen some of that already, and but this focuses on that. Verse 24 says, then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharvam, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. Okay, here's what the Assyrians would do. They would uh, remove you from your homeland to demoralize you. Uh, the prophet Amos talks about when they were taken captive, and it tells us that they, uh, they would they'd line them all up, and big line, and then they'd attach them by ropes and, and so forth, and they'd put a, a fish hook under their bottom lip and march them like that, just to keep uh, control of them and humiliate. I mean, these are the people of God, and they're being humiliated. Uh, they, they, they'd spread you around to other countries so it wouldn't be easy to regather. That's why they're, they're scattered, by the way. And then they would repopulate the country that they that they dominated uh, with other people like they're doing here so they couldn't they no longer be a nation right they it would weaken them and cause all kinds of confusion so that's how the Assyrians took over um, countries and it says in verse 25 and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they did not fear the Lord therefore the Lord sent lions among them which killed some of them huh so <laughs> Now, there's new inhabitants in Samaria, but they don't fear God either. you got a bunch of uh, non-believers taking over Israel, so God sends lions to kill them. Wow, that's pretty heavy. Do you guys remember about 10 years ago, there was a mountain lion loose in Boise, on the Boise River Greenbelt? Do you remember that? And uh, there had I remember being out there, and they had like traps set up for it. And so forth, because, you know, everybody's on a high alert because there's a mo mountain lion loose in Boise uh, someplace prowling around. Can you imagine if there was a whole bunch of them after people, what that would be like? Well, that's what's happening there. 
these are some of the consequences that God's not messing around. You see, it's the holy land. <laughs> and this doesn't, this doesn't fly. Even though he used the Assyrians to teach Israel a lesson, he still doesn't, like, you know, <laughs> promote what they're, what they're doing. They're evil. And he's not going to let them defile the land. Well, it says in verse 26, So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the rituals of the God of the Lamb. Therefore, he has sent lions among them, and indeed they are killing them because they do not know the rituals of the God of the Lamb. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Send there one of the priests whom you brought from there. Let him go and dwell there, and let him teach them the rituals of the God of the Lamb. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Okay, so they, they thought that you just had to appease the God that's mad. And so, you know, whatever we got to do to do that. And, and they think it's all about the rituals, right? Do you guys think it's all about the rituals? No. It's about relationship. <laughs> that's the problem here. It always is the problem. But they think it's rituals, so they're like, hey, somebody go find a Jewish priest, send him back there, and fix this problem, you know. Well, <laughs> remember, the priests aren't good either. <laughs> you know, they're an idolater like everybody else. And so all they're going to do is come back and teach the people false worship and, and, and rituals that don't get anything done, right? However, it says in verse 29, uh, every nation continued to make gods of its own and put them in the shrines on the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in the cities where they dwell. The men of Babylon made Sukkot, ben okay, I'm not going to uh, try and name all these names. I'm just going to skip over where it says, so they feared the Lord. <laughs> and from every class they appointed for themselves priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods. According to the rituals of the nations from among them, they were carried away. I think verse 33 is the key of our study here today. If you want to just kind of zero in on that with me. It says they fear the Lord, but they do what? They serve their own gods. So what does that mean? Well, uh, they say they believe. Have you ever, like, shared the gospel with somebody or tried to talk to them about the Lord? And, and, and they say, well, I believe in God, but they don't live anything like they believe in God, right? It's kind of like that, right? They, they have somewhat reverence that there is a God, perhaps, but I'm not going to obey him. I'm going to make my own way. Or it kind of ends up being sort of a mixed religion kind of a thing, which, you know, that might be the worst way of all when you're trying to mix them. They call that uh, syncretism, where it's defined as merging or blending different religions or different religious ideas and thoughts together. Like, put it all in a blender and hit go, and then whatever comes out, that's my religion, you know, kind of a, a thing. And, an example would be uh, the Rastafarian uh, religion. Uh, it comes out of Jamaica. Uh, because what they've done, based on, uh, as much as I could tell, they've taken some Hebrew uh, ideas and some African thought and some Caribbean uh, rituals and thrown it all in a blender and then made a religion. And you know, the people like the way, you know, that they've created this thing that they do. But that's not of God. <laughs> it's just a man-made way of trying to make the way that we want to be anyway acceptable by God. And so, of course, when you do things like that, it's very inconsistent and it's very confusing for the followers of it. <laughs> like, you know, to me, I think that's why Bob Marley um, was sort of torn and who he was as a person, Rastafarian, you know. I mean, when he was buried, they buried him with uh, a Bible 
a guitar, and a bag of pot. <laughs> a little confused about things there, uh, Bob Marley was. He be jamming, though. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Notice there in verse 32, they said they feared God, but created their own worship. Right? So they had their own priests, their own sacrifices, their own temples. So they didn't really fear God. <laughs> it was, I believe in God. So what were the consequences? We'll look at verse 34. I'm going to read down to 39. It says, And to this day they continue practicing their former rituals. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law and commandment which the Lord had commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord, who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great power and an outstretched arm, him you shall fear, him you shall worship, and to him you shall offer sacrifice. And the statutes, the ordinances, the law, and the commandment which he wrote to you, you shall be careful to observe forever. You shall not fear other gods. And the covenant which I have made with you, you shall not forget, nor shall you fear other gods. But the Lord your God you shall fear and he will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. So again, they appear to have a fear of God, but it's not really genuine. And because it's not really genuine, relational, it's not accepted by him. Even though they're going through all the motions of the religious behavior, their heart is far away from God. They're not being real with God, and that's a problem. It needs to be said here before we finish up that you can't serve two masters. Jesus told us that, right? He said you're going to love one or the other, not both. He's got, he said specifically, and this is Jesus Christ, you can't serve Lord, the Lord, and another God. So I think that most of this is here to urge us, whoever is listening, to choose the Lord and not another God. I mean, it's the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have, God said, you shall have no other gods before me. You know, one day somebody came up to Jesus and they said, what's the most important commandment? And you know which one he said? That one. <laughs> right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Most important commandment. Now, before we finish, let me ask you a question. How do you know if you are serving two masters? If you have more than one God. How do you know that? This uh, guy named F.B. Meyer has a, uh, one of my commentaries I have. It's a really good one. He said this about it. He said, it's whatever conflicts with God is our chosen God. That's pretty heavy if you think about it, isn't it? Whatever conflicts with God is our chosen God. So, for you guys that are believers, if, if, if in, the, in the moment you're presented with something and you choose the way that conflicts with God, then that's your chosen God in the moment. Not that you make a practice of that, because you're a believer. You're going to heaven. You have eternal life. He's lived, the Spirit lives in you. But we can choose those things that conflict God. And, you know, I've done it, and I, I would assume we've all done it in moments. Well, that's, we got to be aware of that, because it, it can lead to those rumble strips again. And, and be careful uh, of those things. That would be our chosen God in that moment. Now, for somebody who doesn't know Jesus, maybe that's you here today, it would be more of a continual practice. You, you just, you know, you choose basically almost everything that conflicts with God because that's what you know. That's what I knew when I was a young man. And that's just how we grow up in this world when we're far from God. We, we choose those things that contradict truth and 
and justice and, and, and God's way. Mercy and grace and those uh, things. So, so I would just urge you, if you're here today and you haven't put your trust in Christ, that you've been doing things and living and believing in, in things that conflict with what God has said, that you would put your faith in him. Because God loves to, to forgive people like you and me. Because <laughs> he loves us. He demonstrated it. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And, and so I would just ask you to consider that for yourself. To, I'm urging you to believe. Put your faith in Jesus. And he will forgive you for everything that you've ever done. Well, let's finish here with verse 40. It says, however, they did not obey and they followed their former rituals. So these nations feared the Lord, yet served their carved images. Also their children and their children's children have continued doing as their fathers did, even to this day. So the Samaritans, you know, this is why in the New Testament, the, the Jews hate the Samaritans because of this. Right? They're, they just don't follow God and they think they do. And, and they just keep right on doing uh, what they want. Yeah, I believe in God, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve God. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do my own rituals and those kinds of things. So I'd like to point out here that we've learned, I hope you've seen, that God is patient. <laughs> I mean, it was 250 years of the northern tribes of Israel going through all this. He waited 250 years before the Assyrian conquest. And so God gives people time to change. He's very patient, long-suffering. And if they had been faithful to him, it would have all turned out different. <laughs> but they did not. And that's how, why it lands there. It's not God's fault. He let them choose, tried to change their mind, and that's what they did. So it's a warning to those who are headed down that same road. And also an encouragement to the believers that God is just. Well, I'd like to invite the worship team uh, back up to sing a last song for us. And I said when we started that I was going to give you uh, a kind of a how-to walk in the fear of the Lord. And we picked up some of them as we went along. But I want to give you uh, one last thing to take home with you. And that's uh, Psalm 34, verses 9 through 14, talks about how to walk in the fear of the Lord for the believers. And here's what it says. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. So it's talking about the believers. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Well, there's a bunch of examples there and something you may want to just mark this down or remember to meditate on this for those of us that are part of the church because we are urged there that there's no lack of good for those who seek to walk with the Lord in the fear of the Lord that reverence that honor right to serve him to do it he says it, he said things like keeping our our tongue from evil and lying and and, you know, that we would do good and, and seek after peace with others and with him. And, and pursue those things. Pursue the Lord. It's a much better way of life. And the, and, the, and, the, and the Bible teaches us that that's who we're supposed to be. Amen? Well, uh, would you guys stand with me? And we'll worship uh, together uh, with Lisa and the team one more time. And, and I just want to send you with a little... Uh, question for the car ride home and then I'll get off here. And here it is. Is there something you treasure that conflicts with God? Is there something that you treasure that conflicts the, with God? Because if there is, maybe it's time today for you to begin to do something about that. Well, God bless you. Uh, um, may you just be richly blessed this week as you walk with your Savior Jesus and just be encouraged uh, by him and his love uh, for you. So let's worship together and then we'll be dismissed, okay? God bless you guys. Mm -hmm.